Good afternoon and welcome to Litson RV where we're broadcasting live right inside our marketing studio where we literally are only one mile north of the Winnebago Itasca and Winnebago Touring Coach Division of Winnebago Industries right here in Forest City, Iowa. I want to welcome all of you to today's live monthly webcast in which I want to introduce a few special guests in which we're going to cover all of your questions and hopefully provide you all the answers on the operation of your Sprinter based motorhome from Winnebago Industries. I want to welcome uh, Jeffrey behind the camera, he's our Special Events and Marketing Director, and Ben Fullman. I think most of you have seen Ben, he does a lot of our uh, YouTube videos and operational videos inside our video library where we have a plethora of information on how to get the most out of your RV experience. Um, also keep in mind, even though we're doing this as a live monthly webcast right now, we can actually broadcast live. Um, anywhere on our campus or inside our studio in the comfort of your own home or office and have a live interactive presentation uh, with any of our factory trained consultants uh, right here at Litson RV. Uh, we can do that on any of our in-stock RVs and our guests have really um, enjoyed doing that because we can show not only the breadth of, of our product knowledge but also the quality that you've known to uh, come and love from Winnebago Industries. So again, today's focus is we're going to put a big old target on the back of Ben Fullman and we're going to allow him to answer all the questions in which we've already got four to start with, so I'm going to cover those right away. This is really your time. Um, so we actually have several different educational orientations on a Winnebago View and Itasca Navion. Uh, we also have an educational orientation video on a Winnebago Touring Coach Era and just uh, recently we did a Winnebago Touring Coach Travato. So um, we're really trying to provide that value to you, our guests, um, irrespective of where you pur purchased your RV, trying to provide you as much value as possible to get the most out of your Winnebago RVing experience. So uh, we have a great scope of library videos inside our website, so be sure to check those out. Uh, ben does many of them so that we thought this would be a good opportunity to actually speak live with him. So again, um, one of the things that has made this most beneficial is if you can chat in your questions. And um, when you uh, log into the chat screen on the right hand side of your screen, uh, you don't have to provide any contact information. You can set up as an anonymous um, uh, ID and then that way we can actually cover your questions live as we go. So uh, we're going to start at the top. We've already got, actually we're up to about a half dozen questions, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, first question was, a guest has a 2014 Winnebago View 24J and would like to know more about metal valve stems. They've been reading about, um, their, they have some challenges in terms of how they check the tire pressure. So maybe Ben, if you could cover how to check if you don't have valve stems and what the benefit could be and what type they should use if they do. So we'll, maybe we'll slide this way, Jeffrey. Yep. Actually, well, on the front ones, um, front ones are easy to access. You do have the port that is sticking out so usually you can access those without taking the hubcap off rear ones are a little different we have to pop the hubcap off and this is if we do not have valve stems so if you do add valve stems we still you can do front valve stems too which does get it out a little further and anytime we do add tpms or any tire minders or any of that stuff we do have to have it on a metal valve stem so that's the front one would be I think it's on the bottom down here, hard to see, but. And Ben, just so the guests know, Ben used an acronym there called TPMS. It's a tire pressure monitoring system. It's a way that you can get real time um, readouts on tire pressure on all six of your wheels and also your dinghy towed vehicle. Yep. Okay, well, we'll move to the back tires. And the back tires are the tough ones. That's where usually where people have the most questions, most problems checking. And again, valve stems are a great add on. So for the back tires, we literally have to get either a screwdriver or something, put it right in between the tire and the rim right here, and you're going to pop this whole hubcap off. That's the easiest way to access your valve stems. Uh, for your front dual, you're actually going to need a reverse checker. So we have to have a checker that we can pull back on and one that we can push forward on. The front dual we're going to pull back to check tire pressures. The rear dual we push back into it to check the tire pressure. The valve stems will actually, for your front dual, it'll loop up, come out the front, give you access without even taking this cover off to check those tire pressures. The back one will come straight out, stick out the front, and again you can check your tire pressure there too. Uh, good stuff. Thank you, Ben. And, and actually we also have a great accessory video in our video library where we've covered um, metal valve stems. We actually use the board metal valve stems here in our dealership. Um, so be sure to check out that accessory video too. 
Um, you can pick those up anywhere, but again, if you do use tire pressure monitoring systems, you really should use metal valve stems so that they're not uh, bouncing around with the sensors that are screwed onto the valve caps. Um, ben, while we're in this area, a guest also chatted in wanting to know, they recently winterized their coach, wanting to know what the best practice is in terms of what they should do with their RV batteries, if they should keep it plugged in, uh, trickle charging, or remove the RV batteries. And they are wet cell in terms of what they have. Okay. Um, well, there's a couple options. Um, the safest thing would actually be take the batteries out, store them in a dry, warm location. You technically don't have to. The main thing is, is that we have a good saturated charge on those batteries before we put them away for storage. So as long as the batteries here under the steps, as long as under the steps here, batteries are out of this coach right now, but your batteries in this model would be under here. The main thing with our batteries is we want the water level to be full. We want to make sure we have that full charge. If we're going to leave them in the coach, then we also want to make sure we hit that battery disconnect when we store it. Um, if you do remove them, just make sure we tape up the connections because anytime we do start the engine or anything, we will be feeding power back to this location. So kind of a preference thing. Uh, a lot of people do leave them in their coach. But again, make sure they're fully charged. And so Jeffrey, we're going to head this way if you don't mind. Uh, same guest um, wanting to know a little bit more about diesel exhaust fluid. They actually have it in their 2014 uh, 24J, um, but maybe Ben, if you could explain what it is. And since it is a 2014, they'll have the diesel exhaust fluid up front. Yep. So diesel exhaust fluid, um, it's an area is what it is. It actually gets pumped into the exhaust, which helps kill carbon monoxide coming out of the exhaust. This is the reason we don't have all that black smoke coming out of your exhaust anymore. Like in the old diesels, you used to always see that big cloud of black smoke. This got rid of that. 2010, the government mandated that we put DEF on any diesel. So it's located up front underneath your hood. It's a 3.4 gallon tank. After you've used two gallons of this tank, you're gonna get a warning on your dash. Once that warning comes on, go ahead and top off your tank. You do not have to wait for that warning to come on before you top this tank off but do let it go down a little ways drive a thousand miles 1500 miles then top it off because this stuff does crystallize so we do want to use some of it before we top it off uh, main thing is stay up on that because if you do run out of def it will lock you out of your coach there's no limp home mode no nothing so make sure we do keep either some on board or make sure you do keep it full Awesome, great question. So keep those questions coming in. Um, another question that Ben and I were chatting about before we actually started, um, a guest has a 2017 View 24J. They do not have the infotainment set up. Um, so I'm guessing that you probably have the standard Pioneer radio that does still have the integrated rear view camera monitoring system. Um, does not have any audio, but does have video. Wanting to know if you could provide any troubleshooting. Um, well, it could be a couple different things. I mean, we could have wiring problems. We could have a problem with the camera speaker itself. Uh, there is usually a setting on the monitor itself that turns that speaker on and off. So in your settings on the camera settings, there should be a, either a speaker or a setting on the settings that turns it on and off. All right, good stuff. Um, another guest chatting in wanting to know um, what is available from the factory in terms of chassis battery disconnect switches and whether uh, one could actually be added if there isn't one. And I, I think this is kind of a, a secret that not a lot of guests know, so maybe we can show that then if that's okay with you. Um, we'll actually show you the chassis battery disconnect switch that actually does come. It's not really even a switch, but we can show you where that terminal separation is. And Jeffrey, you may have to get in there a little tight. Yep. So right under there, there you see a little red tab, which is actually right here. This is actually a disconnect for your chassis. This disconnects the ground off your chassis. What we're gonna do is we're gonna pull this red tab down. We're gonna pull that straight out. That disconnects your chassis battery. The one main thing we wanna make sure though, the sign right here says, wait 10 minutes after shutting the engine off before disconnecting that battery. The main reason is, is we have computers, transmission modules, stuff like that that are shutting down, saving their memories. So make sure we wait that time before we disconnect. But yeah, uh, disconnect under there, that will disconnect that chassis battery. And again, make sure we got a good charge on it. Make sure that battery's not dead when we store it. And then you should be good. We can slide back this way. Um, Jeffrey and Ben, maybe not one for you to cover, but a guest wanting to know where they can get sheets um, for the bed in a 24J. This actually happens to be a 24V, but where they can get uh, sheets when we have split headrests. 
And if you really truly want to split that, you certainly can. There are uh, several different online companies that will do custom fitted sheets. Um, what most guests will actually do is they'll use a queen bed sheet and then bunch up the, um, the footrest section. However, that doesn't provide any solutions for your split headboard. There are some companies online that will actually do um, custom fitted sheets and we have those measurements that we can provide you or you can provide them to them and they'll custom fit those sheets with a split actually down the middle. Uh, another good question, and, and it's been a while since this one's come up, um, the Navions and Views are recommended not to use biodiesel and in an emergency only use 5%. Um, maybe you can touch on that. We've also covered that before in um, Mercedes-Benz Educational Orientation um, webcast that we did, but maybe touch on that and um, some of the maintenance that comes along with that. Okay. Uh, yeah, like I said, the max we can use is a B5 biodiesel. And on this model, on all these models are actually going to tell you right above here for that B5 on there. Um, again, it's kind of one of those things, it's a preference thing, whether you're going to use a biodiesel or not. Myself, I would prefer not to use a biodiesel. I'd rather use just normal ultra low sulfur diesel. Uh, other than that, I mean... Yeah, so, I, and I'll help you out on this a little bit, okay. Ben. Um, so if you are using um, B5 biodiesel, we do actually have um, a pamphlet from Mercedes-Benz that certainly does indicate that you can use it. Um, and that's really prevalent in Midwest states where we have a lot of soy in our, in our diesel, um, especially in Illinois and Minnesota. If you do choose to use B5 biodiesel, be certain to um, check the maintenance on your fuel filter more often, and that's what, that's what Mercedes-Benz recommends. So really be certain to replace that fuel filter more often or certainly checking it to ensure that it, that it is flowing properly because that's where the breakdowns occur and it'll clog that fuel filter. Um, another great question that is, has just recently come up, um, wanting to know when you can actually tow behind an RV. Um, the main thing is, well, anytime after your 1,000 mile break-in period is our main thing. We can do towing after that. Pretty much after that point, you can tow anytime you want to. The best way to tow, uh, I would say, would be flat towing using some kind of blue ox flat tow. Yeah, if you, if you look in the um, owner's manuals um, from Mercedes-Benz, they really recommend during that first 1,000 miles, if you can avoid it, not to do any type of towing, whether it's dinghy, tow car, or even trailer towing. Towing. Um, certainly, if you're conservative, to try to follow that. Um, another question that came up, wanting to know what those break-in speeds should be. And um, generally, the best practice in terms of breaking in a new RV is keeping those speeds below 65 miles per hour. But really, the key is varying your speeds and not jumping in an RV that's fresh and setting the cruise control for six to eight hours and cruising at the same speed. What we're trying to do is seat those cylinders uh, in that three liter turbocharged diesel. So we're trying to seat those cylinders and really get the break-in procedure done correctly. That can mean as simple as getting off at an on-ramp and getting right back on, um, stopping for fuel, stopping for a pit stop, um, but really just trying to vary those speeds. Um, and in a lot of cases, unless you're in very open terrain, it's going to come along with just the ride that you have anyway. So um, about every couple hours, try to vary those speeds um, in terms of breaking it in. Um, a great question um, that just came up, and it's kind of open-ended, so I'll be interested to hear your response. What is the most common overlooked maintenance item on a view? I would say the most common overlooked maintenance item would definitely be batteries. People overlook you know, doing maintenance on batteries, keeping that water level up, making sure, you know, there's no corrosion, stuff like that up on the battery terminals. I think people, when they're under the steps, people forget that they're there. So the main thing is, you know, every month or two, check those batteries, make sure that water level's up, make sure there's no corrosion. I would say that's one of the biggest things that's overlooked. Yeah, so battery maintenance, and we have a lot of guests that will try to swap out those uh, wet cell batteries right away and try to go to AGM or lithium. We've done both here in our dealership, and it really kind of becomes a cost benefit. Generally, what we recommend is at least utilize the wet cell batteries that come with them until you deplete them, and then you can always invest in the future. Or if you want to get it done right from the shoot, we can do that. Uh, but again, a lot of guests do go to AGM or lithium down the road. A couple of product type questions that I'll just go ahead and cover, wanting to know whether or not the 24G floor plan for 2018 will be the same as 2017, and it will be identical. So the 2018 24 G's that come out will be exactly what you see right now for 2017. Uh, a couple other product questions that came wanting to know there's three different types of wheels that you can get on a Viewer and Navion and what you see right here uh, is a steel wheel 
uh, with a stainless steel wheel liner. And that's the majority of the volume that we do. Um, we help guests with more Sprinter based product than any dealership in North America. And this is about 95% of our volume. So it's a steel wheel with a stainless steel wheel liner. Uh, the second option that's available is a chrome wheel option. And actually what it is is a chrome dipped aluminum wheel. We don't do a lot of those, um, primarily because there's not a lot of benefit for the cost. Um, it's about a thousand dollar dealer cost upgrade. You only get the four outer wheels being chrome dipped aluminum. Um, if you put the two side by side, most guests can't tell the two apart. Uh, historically, we've had some issues with flaking, not to say that we will now. Um, so if a guest really wants to upgrade their wheels and they're not okay with steel wheels and stainless steel wheel liners, then we generally recommend the aluminum wheels. And that's actually a forged Alcoa aluminum wheel now for 2017. Uh, it's actually standard on the 24 G's. Um, it's optional on the B's and J's. Uh, again, you only get the four outer wheels. The inner duals are still um, steel wheels. Uh, the main benefit would be that they're slightly lighter. It'll free up a little bit of cargo carrying capacity, but not much. Um, there are some argumentative theories on the internet as well about an aluminum wheel um, rolling truer than a steel wheel. Um, you can actually bend a steel wheel, but in most cases, that's not going to happen in an RV, so 95% of our volume is going to be the standard steel wheel with stainless steel wheel liners. And then we can put in those more metal Borg valve stems if you'd like it, and then tie that in with tire pressure monitoring. Uh, another product related question, wanting to know what floor mats come with a viewer and Navion. So what you'll receive is the um, vinyl flooring that comes along with a fitted and removable um, carpet. Uh, that comes from Winnebago. And then we also offer, a guest was wondering about WeatherTech mats. Uh, that's a laser cut mat that we offer here in our dealership. It's, it's very affordable. It's a great mat because they're actually computer designed and then laser cut by WeatherTech. So uh, it's not an expensive option. It's about $150, but we do offer those right up front. Again, those laser cut WeatherTech mats. Good questions today though. I love the open-ended one. Um, slide out maintenance. A guest would like to know what we should be doing. Okay, um, so on this kind of slide here, we got a twin tech slide. Couple things for maintenance. The main thing we want to do is make sure we do not use like a WD-40 or any petroleum-based lubricant because all that's going to do is draw dust, draw anything else. It's going to make this work a lot harder. Make that motor bind down work a lot harder. So here we use a lot of CRC. Pretty much any moving part on here, I use CRC. It's uh, uh, graphite graphite lube, lubricant um, on the slide wise the main thing we're trying to lube is behind the seal is right down in this little channel here back here there's a gib so we want to lubricate that gib and then down in the bottom there's a roller underneath we're trying to lubricate that roller and we have to do that on all four of the mechanisms that's just going to help it run a lot smoother Make sure it's not binding, make those motors run a lot more freely. Pretty much what's gonna happen if I get too much silt and other stuff built up on there, those motors are gonna amp out, which means your room's not gonna come all the way in, not go all the way out. So main thing is keep those tracks clean all the way around. The other thing we use is a 303 aerospace on all of the rubber seals. So it's a rubber conditioner and lubricant pretty much. Every so often just spray them down, wipe them off. Keep the side rooms clean too. That will help this room run a lot better too. Yeah, and as a follow-up to that, the reason why we use 303 is because those rubber squeegee seals work great, um, but the downside to them is if you allow UV to penetrate those a lot over time, they can dry out and they crack, and then that's when they can permeate water. A good follow-up question to that that's actually a little bit further down, and I'm going to get to you all your questions, so this one was just tied in with the slide out. If the motor fails, how do you retract the room? Okay, motor fails, what we have to do is actually, on the outside here, we're going to remove this trim here. All we got to do is get a screwdriver or something underneath the bottom, pry a little bit, and then that whole thing will just pop off. That's just clipped on there. After that, you're going to see a bunch of screws up the side here. Remove all those screws to get this bulb seal off, this rubber seal. Once I get that off, you'll have access to the motor up there. That motor has one screw from the outside that's holding it in from pop coming up. So what we need to do is remove that screw. We're going to lift the motor up half an inch do the same thing on the other side then what we're going to do is push this room in after we disengage those motors the room is actually free to move in and out 
Once you get this room back in, drop the motors back down to lock it in place. Take it to your nearest <laughs> dealer to get serviced. Wow, great questions today. So another one that came up, do we have a preferred tire pressure monitoring system that we use? Uh, we use, it's a uh, tire miner. Tire miner. <laughs> yep. Yes, we use tire miner here. Um, they've been very, very good for us. That's pretty much the only one that we offer here at the dealership. And again, you can use them on your tow car, on the coach. You get a little iPad pretty much, or iPod, that sits up front that gives you tire pressures, gives you tire temperatures. Temperatures are just as important as tire pressures. Keep an eye on both of those. It's going to help your tires last a lot longer. And then we can also program that so that you'll actually get alerts as to high or low tire pressure. So you can actually set it and forget it. Um, you can also get alerts on the temperature. One nice thing about the tire miner system is that it comes with a booster that we actually run to the rear um, so that you get real good, strong connection to those rear duals. Or if you're ever towing a vehicle, uh, we can expand that then to include your dinghy towed vehicle. Um, another question that came up, I guess, just kind of broadly talking about the fact that there are a lot of modifications and a lot of aftermarket accessories on the suspension um, of a view or a Navion, uh, and then also a question on, on stabilizers. So with respect to suspensions, um, the one thing that you have to keep in mind is there, there are going to be a lot of aftermarket accessories, and there's going to be a lot of vendors that, that will tout different um, shocks and different suspension enhancements. And our recommendation, because we are pretty conservative people, is to very simply use what you have, and if you're unhappy with it, then seek out a solution. Because in most cases, uh, the benefit's not going to be that substantive. Otherwise, we would either offer it standard or we would offer it here in our dealership because we felt that it added that much value. So be cautious, but if there's something that you want to um, provide more benefit to, let us know and we can kind of steer you in that right direction. Early in the view and Navion life cycle in 06 and 07, when we had the um, earlier inline five chassis, um, we did do some suspension enhancements, with the, but they were typically more in um, the shock arena than anything else. But we really haven't for a lot of years because it really is a wonderfully um, handling vehicle, especially in conjunction with the adaptive ESP technology that we utilize for superior ride and handling. So that really helps a lot. Um, with respect to the question on stabilization, there's really, there's really three different ways you can stabilize and or level the RV. In terms of stabilization, um, you can do uh, an electric stabilizer um, just for the rear. Um, typically, and the one thing that our dealership's known for is our partnership with HWH in terms of hydraulic leveling, um, where the factory is based here in Iowa. Uh, ben and actually his um, uh, team members can also do HWH installations right here in our dealership now uh, with our new light duty maintenance uh, center that we have. So we can actually do them at the factory in Moscow, Iowa, or we can do them right here. Um, one thing that's known on the internet within our dealership is because we're, we're handling most of that for you um, either through the factory or through here. We do a nice discount compared to what you would receive if you called HWH and tried to book directly. So. Those are true hydraulic, one-touch automatic hydraulic leveling jacks. Um, and it's kind of the extreme in terms of cost. Um, however, it provides the most benefit. So it's just up to you as to whether or not you want to spend the money for it. Um, there is also a way that you can use um, leveling in terms of Lynx levelers. And they kind of look like the larger Lego blocks. Uh, basically, you set what you feel that you need for grade change on either side and drive up over the blocks and they come in a bag of 10 they're pretty nominal in terms of how much space they take up as well uh, another good question that just came in ben wanting to know what is the easiest way to connect a battery tender to the chassis battery technically the easiest way to do that um, where we do most of ours is actually under the passenger seat you actually have two solenoids under there one's a battery disconnect the other one's a battery boost solenoid so we actually tie them in under there a lot of times um, Otherwise, you do have a port up front that we can attach it into, which right here would be a positive cable port here, and then we have the ground over on the sidewall. So you can put it up here. Um, the best location probably would be under the seat, just so it's not handling all that road debris, all the weather, all that stuff. Yeah, so if it was just a temporary connection that you just wanted to do during storage, you could actually install it right here. This um, large open area is actually where a second uh, chassis battery would be included if that was ordered through Mercedes-Benz that way. So you could actually add a second battery there, but if it's temporary, you could add it there. Otherwise, we can tie it into the solenoids like Ben's referring to. So that anytime you actually plug in the RV, it also uh, charges your chassis battery. Um, good question that just came up. Um, 2015 24G. 
so that's going to be the European style three-way refrigerator with yep. a removable freezer. Um, gets frost on the fins of the refrigerator on the right hand side. Wanting to know if there are any solutions you could think of. Um, there should be, if you look back at the fins, there should be actually a thermistor is what they call it. It's a little clip that's on the fins. And in your manual it'll tell you exactly how many fins that should be over. Because if we're too far to the middle, it's going to start frosting on that side. That's actually reading the temperature of the fridge, or actually the temperature of those fins. So if it gets too far over, it starts freezing these to satisfy that. So check your manual. Usually I believe it's five to six fins over, but check the manual and make sure where it should be located. Um, otherwise, on the outside, make sure your venting's not clogged or any of that stuff, dust, anything on the outside um, access panels. Just take those off, look up there, and make sure there's no nests, any, anything that got built in there. Because we have to actually get plenty of airflow going through those vents to actually keep these fred, fridges cool. So check those two things. Uh, kind of a simple question, wanting to know the best way to attach a sewer hose uh, carrier to a viewer in Avion. Well, the best way technically would be to put it in a rubber make container, put it in that compartment. But um, a lot of people I have seen modify them underneath the back. And again, it's an aftermarket thing. I've seen PVC pipes under there. You just kind of got to be cautious what we're screwing into and where to put it. But the easiest way is a rubber egg container in a storage compartment. Yeah, there, there is. I mean, you'll see white PVC with literally the same type of a sewer cap that you might see in a plumbing store. And you can actually attach that. There is an aftermarket accessory that's really affordable that's actually black, so it kind of hides itself. And you can actually D-ring clamp it to spots on the chassis, and, and then it just kind of glides as you go down the road. But it's the most sanitary way. Um, another good open-ended question. What is the best mod you've ever seen on a viewer in Avian? The best modification that someone's ever made? <laughs> uh, I've seen a lot. Uh, I, I would still say HWH jacks. Jacks are probably the best modification you can make. One button push levels you. It's going to help everything. I mean, stabilization. So I would definitely say HWH jacks. Yeah, they're nice because um, they come with large sand pads. And so if you are on looser terrain, um, you know, they're not going to drive through compared to some other leveling systems, but we still offer the Lynx pads for them. You can also use a, a you know, a two by 12 or whatever you want, a two by six, whatever, um, just to slide underneath. But they're one touch automatic. So literally you touch a button and you're level in about 20 seconds. We also kind of do some coaching in terms of where we should be putting the pad that will provide the most easiest, the easiest access for you, thinking about how you're going to actually utilize the RV. A um, couple follow-up questions, um, Ben, from uh, some of the slide-out maintenance that we just talked about. Um, mentioned CRC and wanting to know if it's CRC power or CRC 336 multi-purpose lubricant. Uh, I believe I'd have to look exactly what it is. I don't know if you were talking about the lube or the um, protectant. The protectant is 303. That's 303. So yep. if that didn't come through correctly, that's 303 and that's for the squeegee seals. Yep. But in terms of the lubricant on... It's CRC power, I believe, is what that one okay. is. The other thing you can do also is we do have um, live staffed chat on our website and our parts professionals right behind us um, are actually live on chat 24-7. So um, if you want to chat that question in, we can actually even get that priced out for you in terms of which one we recommend. Um, in terms of retracting a slide out that has a failed motor, um, the older views and Navions had a crank that you could use from the inside. Is that still correct? No. And, and that changed when we went to the Schwintech slides. Yep. Another product question, um, wanting to know when a 2018 could be ordered. Um, they can actually be ordered now, and, um, but they're actually not going to arrive until early summer. Uh, so kind of in that June time frame, um, and we don't have pricing yet. So right now we have 2017s that are price protected against that price increase. Uh, and again, it'll probably be about another four months until you can do 2018. Uh, another question, and I don't know how much you've seen this, but a guest wanting to know if decals are available for the older RVs. Uh, yeah, usually they are. Uh, again, our parts department usually can find almost any decal, not guaranteeing every decal, but most of them they can find. Um, also, um, there's a little bit of offline chatter going on right now between different guests that are on our chat forum wanting to talk about the differences between a Thor product and a Winnebago product. Um, one guest really talking about um, quality of construction in the Winnebago line, um, and then another guest specifically talked to construction of cabinetry. And we've had some Thor trade-ins, and in fact we have one in inventory right now, 
Um, maybe you can touch on that a little bit if you've seen any significant um, build differences. You know, the quality is there. I mean, Winnebago's got a lot more quality. They've been doing it a long time. They know what they're do doing. They pretty much try to perfect everything. <clears throat> you know, Thor, I've seen <laughs> a lot of shoddy stuff come out of Thor. Let's just say that any of these trades that are coming in have been put together pretty cheaply. Uh, Winnebago, you won't see that cheapness. You'll see just high quality, which is a great feature of Winnebago. Um, another good question that came in, and it was earlier, so I apologize. I just reviewed everything to make sure that we've covered all of your questions. A guest wanting to know, so they're seeing a lot more solar uh, panel um, coming from Winnebago or even from accessories that are offered in different um, parts stores and dealerships. Wanting to know what value does that provide them if they mostly go from resort to campground to campground to resort and they're really always being plugged in? Um, if you're always being plugged in, there's not a lot of value there. I mean, they're definitely going to help charge your batteries in those times you're not plugged in. But if you are doing a lot of dry camping, again, the more solar panels that we have, the more demand we can cover. Pretty much what we want to think of solar panels as, as a trickle charger. They're charging our batteries. So they're not actually feeding us a load, our supply. They're just charging batteries that the batteries feed our supply. So it all depends on what we are doing. If you're always plugged in, I wouldn't add a bunch of solar. Again, I mean, if you're dry camping a lot, then put as much as you need on there. Yeah, and, and we talk a lot about that through solar webcasts and um, also through some of the um, other videos that are in our video library. The primary goal of solar is very simply what Ben just mentioned. It charges your RV batteries. So it's not going to allow you to run additional appliances. It's not going to allow you to run um, additional 110 volt appliances that otherwise aren't tied into an inverter which allows you to power those appliances off your RV batteries. The main goal of solar is very simply to charge your RV batteries. If you do put it in storage, it also acts as a maintainer in the event that you actually do have open air storage. So if you don't store it inside, that solar is hardwired directly to the RV battery. So it does operate as a battery tender to keep those charged up, even if you turn that auxiliary battery disconnect switch off. Um, another great question that came in, um, guest wanting to know, so they actually have an 09 24H and wanting to know, they don't think they actually have that um, auxiliary battery disconnect switch, but just wondering if we can talk a little bit about what disconnect switches have been used for chassis batteries over time. And from 08 forward, all of those should have that disconnect on that terminal that we just showed, which is right above the accelerator pedal. Anything else that you can think of that maybe I missed? Uh, no, I mean, it, in case it doesn't have one of those disconnects, uh, pretty much you'll probably have to go to a service dealer or something to have one installed, because we'll have to tear the floor up to access the battery and then put an inline disconnect, probably remote feed it up here to the front where you have access to it. So it's kind of something you probably should take to your service dealer for something like that. Uh, Guest has a 17 uh, Navion. Uh, they're planning on coming to Iowa this summer. They have some paint work that needs to be done uh, just below the grill. Uh, wanting to know if um, we do that type of work and we certainly can coordinate that for you. Um, guest also mentioned that it's actually um, should be done under warranty and, and we can actually do that for you and the one thing that you'll never hear any of our team members here say is if you call in for service we will never ask you where you purchased the coach. We will help you regardless of where you purchased your coach. Uh, our service team members are absolutely non-discriminatory. They do a great job for us. Many are former Winnebago employees uh, that really know these products inside and out. So we will absolutely help you with that. Uh, another question that came in, um, can you plug in these RVs to 50 amp service? Yes, as long as we have the right adapter. Uh, we want a 50 to 30 amp adapter, pretty much. It takes your 50 amp cord, reduces it down to your 30 amp cord. Pretty much what we're doing is we're dropping a leg off of that. So instead of two 110s coming in, we're only using one of the 110s coming in, feeding our 30 amp. The other good thing is to have a 30 to 20 adapter. Carry both adapters with you. I mean, just in case you go to a campground or something, all they have is 50 or all they have is 15 or 20 amp. You can plug into both of those then. Another product related question that came in, wanting to know if there are any plans to lengthen the View and Navion lineups by about a foot uh, to add a larger bathroom. And um, I would highly doubt that. We just recently um, expanded the RVs to be 25.5, which I think is going to be about the brink of tolerance for what Mercedes-Benz will allow for extended um, overhangs beyond the wheelbase requirements that we have. So they're all 25.5 now, um, and then wanting to know what the current measurements are on a 24G shower. And um, 
we actually have those. So if you chat in and just ask any of our sales consultants, we have those. Unfortunately, I don't have them with me right now, but we do. Um, ben, another good question, wanting to know what's involved if they wanted to add solar to their current RV and it didn't come from the factory with solar. Um, well, it depends how, how new the RV is and whether it's pre-wired for solar or not. If it's pre-wired, you still have to drill through the roof, bring the wires up, put a distribution box up on the roof, and then we have the access of plugging three solar panels in on the roof. If it's not pre-wired, then we have to run all the wires into the control. Then we got to go from the control all the way down to the batteries. Um, also, if it's pre-wired, underneath the passenger seat, they're going to have just a loose wire under there. We have to put a fuse and hook that actually up to the solenoids under there. So there's a couple steps to actually hooking up solar. It's usually better, again, by someone that's done it before. But. So we told you we were going to put a big target on your back. Oh. So here's a loaded question. What are your personal thoughts on lithium? Lithium batteries. Uh, again, it's a personal thing. I haven't dealt with a ton of lithium since they're so new, but there's pluses, there's minuses. I've heard both ways. The cost is up there a lot. So like Ron I, I, said earlier, I would use the batteries we have in the coach um, and then go from there pretty much. These, if you're plugged in all the time, these are gonna do plenty for you. I think it just comes down to cost versus benefit. I mean, there, there's clearly benefits to lithium. I mean, we're seeing it all in our household um, electronics that we use. Um, there's definitely benefits to it. The, the downside to it is the cost. Um, some of our guests just want to have it done. They want to have it done right. And then generally that's when we do the lithium installs um, because they want it done right. They want it done with RVDA certified technicians like Ben that know what they're doing. Um, but it is expensive. Um, it's a lot more expensive than AGM. We've used AGM for a lot of years as well. Uh, a couple more operational questions, uh, Ben. Uh, guest wanting to know if we could help them insulate hot water tubing in a 17 Navion J that has the six gallon gas and electric water heater. Um, I guess the main thing is, as long as we're on the furnace, we shouldn't really have to insulate those lines. But if you did, every all your water lines are actually above grade. We can usually get to all those water lines either by removing a panel underneath the bed, you know, we can get to them to insulate them if you do want to. But main thing is use that furnace. That forced air LP furnace is going to help keep everything thought out. And that's what it's there for. So freezing conditions, anything, use the furnace. And usually you'll be fine. Uh, another good question. Um, this is a, a simple one because I'm reading another one as, as we go here. Um, will my refrigerator, if it's three-way, run off of 12 volt if they're dry camping and not running the powertrain? And, you and, have to be running the engine. Yeah, yeah, and so that's really the takeaway. The in terms of the way the new style setups are, they are three-way. But in order to take advantage of that 12-volt functionality, you do have to have the motor running. Okay, um, another good question. Um, if I want to have you service an Avion, provide you a list ahead of time, how far in advance should I book the appointment? If if maintenance takes more than a day, are there places to stay? And also, do you do um, non-coach work, meaning work on the Mercedes um, side? So. Um, we actually have great flexibility. We just recently um, uh, went through uh, an expansion on our service department, so we have more capacity than we've ever had. Always works best to book uh, well in advance. Typically, kind of that um, May to about uh, August time frame, uh, we can be a couple of weeks out, depending upon what all is involved. Um, if we do have work that spills over more than one day, we actually have 26 sites right here on site where you can stay right here with us. Otherwise, there are some wonderful campgrounds and resorts um, throughout the area if you want something a little bit more scenic. But right here, we have um, on-site hookups available that are absolutely free to you when you're here doing any type of service work um, or if you're a guest that has worked with us in the past. Um, we do also do um, non-coach work, so we'll do all of the maintenance that you need on the Mercedes itself. Uh, from a chassis perspective, the only thing that we cannot do is any warranty work. Uh, and that would have to be done through a Mercedes dealer. But any of the light duty maintenance we can do for you right here. Another question, um, are the Sprinter chassis pretty do-it-yourself friendly for oil changes and routine maintenance? Uh, yeah, for the most part they are. The main thing, it takes you know, 13 quarts of oil. Uh, use the right oil. Refer to your manual. There's a specific oil that Mercedes wants in their coaches. So make sure you use that oil. Otherwise, it's a lot like a vehicle. I mean, the plug's underneath, drain it. Filter actually is on top here. It's a cartridge filter instead of the normal screw off filters. So right up top here underneath this cap is where that oil filter is. 
you can use the Mercedes one. They do make a universal one. So if you go to your local parts or automotive store, they'll probably have a universal filter that will fit that. Um, other than that, I mean, checking fluids are all <laughs> up right up here front. You got coolant, your def, you have your brake fluid over here, washer fluid, and then power steering. So some good questions on uh, batteries today. Another follow-up question to that. Wanting to know if one of the 12 volt outlets on the dash is wired hot all the time so that they could use a maintainer through that outlet. There is. Uh, the one that's all the way down at the bottom of your dash, not in the pull-out drawer, is hot all the time. The one that you pull out in that pull-out drawer that has that cigarette lighter in it, that one is ignition controlled. Uh, similar question, guest wanting to know if they can actually add additional USB charge power points um, throughout the dash area. Um, it's kind of those things. I mean, pretty much anything's possible. You can put customization anywhere you want to. It's a matter of drilling holes in right places and finding the right power. So. And then a follow-up question because you knocked it out of the park on DEF and I didn't retain it. So if you could walk through the capacities and how long DEF will last again. Okay, capacity is 3.4 gallons on the capacity of the DEF tank. After two gallons are used, we're going to get that warning on your dash. After that warning comes on, they'll give you so many starts or so many miles. Whatever one comes first, and then it locks you out of your coach after that. And roughly, could you translate that into mileage? Uh, we usually say it right around 3,600 miles, but it's all going to vary how much idling time we've done, all that stuff. So everything kind of plays into that. You know, I think people get also a little bit nervous about DEF, but it is so commonly dispensed now that, you know, when they when it first came out, as Ben mentioned, for the 2010 chassis year, people got really shaken up about it because it wasn't being dispensed and they had to buy the jugs and fill it up and people don't like using funnels and they don't like spilling chemicals around. So it was a little bit more intimidating. Now you can dispense it just like you can at major over-the-road truck stops. So it's very simple to do and it's really kind of a non-event and it's also not very expensive. Um, it does burn off the nitrous oxide, like Ben said, in the emissions. Another product question that came in, so I'll handle this one. Um, guest says that their local dealer only stocks diesel generators. All of ours are LP generators, wanting to know if we could explain why. So we will help guests with probably around 300 to 320 sprinters this year, which is a lot for a dealership. Um, it makes up about 60% of our total volume. So we have a good pulse on how people are using these. Um, there is a significant cost versus benefit upgrade with a diesel versus an LP generator. Um, a diesel generator upgrade is roughly around $4,400 on a retail price basis. Um, it is absolutely more efficient. Um, a diesel generator will burn uh, diesel fuel off the top three quarters of the 26.4 gallon fuel tank at about three tenths of a gallon per hour at half load. Uh, an LP generator is absolutely clean burning. It runs between three and six tenths of a gallon per hour, depending upon your load. So it's not as energy efficient, but typically based on our experience, what we have found is that trade-ins, um, so for future resale value, there's not significant um, incremental resale value by going to a diesel generator. They're priced almost the same. Um, and with that incremental uptick, we typically see then when they come back in on trade, it would be very unusual for us to have a trade-in even if it's five to seven years uh, old with more than a hundred hours on your generator. So if you're not getting that forty four hundred dollar um, incremental resale in the future you kind of have to ask yourself would I really ever spend in my right mind anywhere from twenty six to say forty four dollars an hour to run my generator which nobody in their right mind would. So unless you plan on doing just an incredible amount of off the grid, hotel camping, dry camping without any shoreline power for the masses, uh, probably about 90 to 95 percent of our volume will all be LP generators. They're clean burning, uh, they're standard, there's no incremental um, uptick for it. Uh, LP is readily available, especially at RV truck stops, or excuse me, RV friendly over the road stops, and so it just makes a lot more sense for people. So that's why we stock LP generators, it's because most people that's the way that they use their RVs. Um, how difficult is it to re replace the fuel filter? Uh, not fun. It actually <laughs> is pretty difficult. The easiest way is actually removing all of this. All of your air cleaner, all that stuff needs to come out. Your fuel filter is actually underneath here. The biggest thing on that fuel filter, there's tiny, tiny little clips. 
and you'll break them really, really easily. And what that's doing is that's undoing the fuel lines going to it. And if you break one of those, they're not cheap to replace and not easy to replace. So again, if you're going to do a fuel filter, probably take it to either a service dealer or Mercedes to do that. Uh, another good question. Um, what is the minimum amount of runtime you would recommend each month to exercise a generator? Two hours a month under a 50% load. So we want to be running the air conditioning, turn a fridge on, water heater, something. Again, more we run these generators, the better they're going to run for you. So put those hours on. Get at least two hours a month on. Yeah, it is healthy to do that. And so you kind of have to ask yourself if you have one right now, go out and see how many generator hours you have and what year it is. And hopefully if it's a year old, you've got 24 hours on your gen or 48 hours or depending upon how old it is. Uh, doing the math to make sure that you've exercised it. That can become an expensive component to replace if you don't exercise it and maintain it. Yep. Um, Guest has been having some issues with a Rand McNally infotainment center, uh, 2015-24G, um, wanting to know how they can upgrade that or how do they do it with the memory card that comes with it. Um, you want to take that SD card out, goes in your computer, website's actually in your manual, it's Rand McNally's website, They'll walk you through step-by-step step how to upgrade that memory card, the SD card that's in there. Yeah, and that memory card that comes from Rand McNally, they're actually about that same time frame when you bought your 2015, they came up with an upgraded card that, that doubled the size of the card, and they'll provide you a new card free of charge. Um, the other thing, as Ben mentioned, as soon as you slide that SD card into your computer, if you're running Windows 7 or Windows 10, it will self-launch an installer. Uh, to actually upgrade that. So there's, a, there's an EXE file on there that will actually self-launch and will show you and walk you through how to upgrade that. The other thing to remember is on that card, there aren't just map updates. There's actually updates to the radio itself as well. And when you update that card, it will pr provide the latest firmware for that infotainment center. So really good question there on the infotainment center. Um, looks like we're kind of winding down. Um, Product related question, guests wanting to know why they removed the batch back hatch access on a 24V, which is actually what this is. And really it was designed that way to make room for adding the bike rack option that's available. Um, and so it did become a little bit more difficult to actually winterize a 24V, um, as you know, um, but really it was designed so that we could add a uh, factory installed bike rack to the back of a 24V. They did actually add an uh, access port on your headrest. Yep. Two screws, pop it out, you have full access to all your winterizing stuff. From inside. From inside, yep. yep. From inside. So, um, whereas before people used to actually use that back hatch. Yep. Yep. So that was the, the trade off to it. Uh, we covered that, we had another question coming in on um, whether, whether they could add solar, then allow them to run their refrigerator longer. Um, and as we mentioned, you actually have, do have to have your engine running to be able to run your refrigerator off a of 12 volt. Um, another question coming in, uh, any issue with the tankless water heater switch being outside instead of inside? No, I haven't had any um, issues yet, I guess, but no, haven't had any problems with that at all. Uh, another good question, wanting to know if the surround sound works with the TV antenna or just with the DVD player? Uh, it'll work with both, actually. So the second you put a DVD in, it's going to automatically play through those surround sound speakers. Um, if we want to backfeed our TV through that surround sound, we usually have to put it on some kind of auxiliary in on the DVD player itself. And then that volume on your surround sound is going to be based on your TV volume also. So if you have your speakers on your TV down to zero, you're not going to get anything out of that surround sound. Make sure we turn both of them up to get volume out of there. So I just want to make sure that your wife's watching right now. <laughs> uh, Ben's wife, Nicole, actually works for us. Uh, she's a factory trained consultant. That actually solved a bet that we had, and so now she can buy me lunch tomorrow. So if you're watching, just cue yourself up for that. Uh, we had uh, George44, uh, as his handle was, wanting to know, um, doesn't see um, a lot of low profile, meaning without the overhead bed, uh, 24Gs, and wanting to know if it's too late to order one. Um, and um, we can actually help with that. We actually have a low profile 24G in stock. We stock both. Um, but if you want, wanted to order one, we can look at what content ours doesn't have, but we can help you with a uh, 24G low profile. Uh, this happens to be a 24B with the rear twin beds.
Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, can a fantastic fan be added to a view, uh, which I'm assuming then would replace the standard fan? And there's actually a couple of different options that we have now. A fantastic fan, that's fantastic industries. So it's powered and insulated. We can also retrofit it with a um, Max Air Premium vent system. Yep. You know what the difference is in cost? Uh, I don't right offhand, no. Okay. Um, 24G, uh, um, so the rear queen bed, is there 12 volt access underneath the bed? Would like to run CPAP on 12 volt. There is 12 volt back there, but it's a matter of tying in to the actual Winnebago wires that would be back there, or actually the distribution panel that would be back there. There's no pre wired 12 volt back there. So it'd be tying into existing line that's back there. But now even though there is no existing 12 volt plugs underneath the bed, um, there are uh, 12 volt charging points overhead, but also keep in mind the 110 outlets, the electrical outlets back there in that bedroom are also tied into the inverter. So you could run that 1000 watt inverter. So depending on what type of a CPAP or VPAP you had, you could actually just plug it in and turn your inverter on, uh, depending on the capacity. Um, and, uh, Conan35 has a question that's way over my head. So wanting to know if the spark arrestor clean out plug for the propane generator is easy to get at. No, it's actually pretty far back. <laughs> There's um, yeah, it's around the right side. So yeah, it's not easy to get to. Usually any of that stuff you have to do, it's a lot of times easier to drop the generator, pull the whole cover off. Uh, Al has a question. He has a Navion 24G wanting to know, is there a way to get a dish receiver to change channels when the TV cabinet is closed? Um, as there's no IR signal to the remote. Yeah, there's uh, two ways. You can actually get an IR booster, which is a little eye that's going to come out, plug into a little module that actually will go up top in that cabinet, come out, put it anywhere you want to, face the remote at that. Other option you have is to actually get an RF remote. An RF remote uses radio frequencies, will go right through the TV pretty much and change channels. Yeah, and the nice thing about an RF remote is not only then can you use it in the front, you could actually use it in the back if you have that dish receiver running with HDMI wiring to that rear bedroom TV. So um, what Ben's referring to with the IR um, emitter, again, you still have to point the remote at it, um, which works great up front. It's an easy do-it-yourself way that you can handle the front, but if you actually uh, switch over to an RF remote, whether it be through Dish Network or if you go out and purchase an RF remote like a Logitech remote, uh, we have Logitech Harmony remotes that we do here. The nice thing about that is you can actually um, change channels within about a block of your RV because you can use them just about everywhere. So you could use them in the bedroom, you could use them up front, and you could also use it on the patio if you have an outside TV. Okay. Good questions. Um, there's one I'm looking for that I know I skipped over. I apologize. How often should you do upgrades on Rand McNown? Uh, we recommend one, at least once a year, but you know, as often as you want to. You can do it every couple of months if you want to, just to make sure you got the uh, most recent firmware, most recent maps. You know, kind of whenever you want to, just update it. Great questions today, and I really want to thank Ben for joining us. Um, I know a lot of you have watched a lot of Ben's videos. He does a great job for us. Um, guests love to work with Ben because he's so easy to speak to. Um, and as Nicole knows, you can never aggravate the guy. So he, <laughs> thank you again for joining us. Uh, Jeffrey, thank you for uh, working behind the camera. And again, I want to thank all of you today for joining us. Well, we took all of your questions live on the Winnebago View and Itasca Navion. Uh, we will archive this video and it will be inside our video library on Linson.com where you can find all of our previous live webcasts where we've archived those as well as just a ton of how-to videos uh, and ways that we can add more value to your RVing experience. Also keep in mind that if there's something that you want to see on something that we have in stock, whether it's new, pre-owned, or whatever, we can actually do a live interactive presentation uh, from the comfort of your own home or office uh, where we can broadcast live right here on our campus or inside our studio. We can take all of your questions live. We'll be mic'd in and we can literally walk you through it as though you were right here in our facility where we're here at Litson RV, only a mile north from Winnebago, right here in Forest City, Iowa. Again, thank you for joining us today. Be sure to chat any additional questions that you have in on our chat icon, which is available on all the pages on our website, um, or you can email us at sales at and we'll get back to you right away. So again, thank you for joining us today, and again, thank you, Ben, where we covered all of your questions on the Winnebago View and Itasca Navion.